Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another Tea Time SEO session. I'm Lawrence O'Toole, the CEO of Authoritas. Um, with me today, I've got Carrie Shepherd from Authoritas and three excellent speakers. Uh, you know, it's been a year since we started uh, these Tea Time SEO sessions, and we've had some fantastic talks on all sorts of topics in SEO and content marketing. And today, I'm sure, will be no exception. We've got three excellent speakers uh, from Canada, an agency just in Norwich, where I was near there on holiday recently. Very nice and sunny, very windy, um, but I'm sure your talk won't be. It's Brendan Bennett. And um, second, we've got Imogen, uh, who can be found working at Found in London, uh, a great agency based in the center of town there. And last, but most certainly not Nice, uh, you know, a partner of uh, Authoritas in Turkey. Uh, he's hiding behind possibly the most professional mic setup we've seen on Tea Time SEO, Toro <laughs> Tuba. So thank you all so much for joining us today. We're really looking forward to talking about technical SEO. There's a lot to cover. So we'll get straight to it with Brendan. Well, I guess it's a little intro opportunity. Um, so I've been in SEO for quite brisk six years. Uh, I found my way into this industry quite uh, unconventionally through copywriting and graphics design before. Uh, and so that's a particular interest in my topic today is uh, technical audits as a kind of challenge of presenting information uh, in a presentable way. And yeah, I'm looking forward to giving a talk and hearing everybody else's today. Great. And I see you're a full time geek. Uh, is that Dungeons and Dragons? That uh, is Dungeons and Dragons. Um, oh, my interests okay, also go into comic books and video games. Uh, if you think it's geeky, I'm probably into it. I can't remember the last time I played Dungeons and Dragons with those funny shaped dice, but it was a long time ago. Okay. And uh, now, Imogen, if you'd like to just give us a bit of your background. Perfect. Uh, it's one Imogen. I am head of marketing at Found at the moment, but recently sort of moved into it after doing sort of six years agency side in SEO. Um, so my background is very much sort of the, the technical and the on-page SEO. And obviously, as you can see, they're a huge history fan. So anyone who wants to go out clubbing at some point when we can, let me know. <laughs> Is that Kiss the band with the, the black and white makeup? I'm showing my age here because uh, no, I'm Irish, no, Irish Kiss the is like old school garage, like 2000s, 1990s, like garage music. I gotcha. I gotcha. <laughs> I, might meet, I might meet you in the pub afterwards. Uh, okay. <laughs> and uh, last but not least, Coro. And my name is Coro Tuberkur. I am owner and founder of Logistics and Digital. I have created my company during the pandemic, and I am trying to learn machine learning during the pandemic, and I am failing constantly, but I don't give up yet. And I am trying my best. I'm happy to be here. Well, um, thanks ever so much for joining you. I know everyone's worked extremely hard uh, during lockdown, doctors, nurses, firefighters, you know, everybody. Uh, I'm not sure anyone's uh, in just the marketing industry has, has worked quite as hard as Corre, who's, who's set up his own business, learned machine learning, has written numerous articles and blog posts, left, right and center and case studies. So uh, I think you're the man that doesn't sleep, but we'll find out. So um, let's get into the talks uh, with Brendan. Right, so uh, as mentioned, I'm gonna talk about technical audits, uh, specifically what I might call a cookie cutter approach or a one size fits all method of going about technical audits. Uh, and this was inspired by an audit that a client of mine received not too long ago from a government department uh, of international trade, no less, which basically amounted to five or six printouts of automatic reports from different auditing tools. Uh, which then required a lot of assistance for that client to suss out and get to the bottom of which recommendations were actually the most useful or relevant to them. It made me think that although what I've got to say is probably not news or even remotely mind-blowing for a lot of you experts out there, there could still be some value in explaining how or why to avoid going about this overly templated approach to doing audits. My perspective basically being that you know, if you've given or received uh, an audit that can be produced at the click of a button, that's probably below the standard of what we should all be aiming for together. So uh, my first tip is for SEOs and the business side of things, really, which is to do with uh, having a little bit more intimacy with each other, which after a year of social distancing, I'm, I'm probably sure we all want more of. But what I really mean here is uh, a greater understanding 
or sharing of information between the business or website owner and the site auditor. It's really about knowing uh, what's most important, what the objectives of the business as well as the website are, uh, what are their major focus areas, what major projects have they undertaken or are undertaking. Because, you know, it's easy to say that you want to rank in Google, but there's a question of which queries you want to rank for, what types of pages, uh, in what context, what your competitors, what's the search landscape like? These are all relevant questions to be asking. Knowing the team is also about knowing the size of the organization, the receiver of the audit, um, what are their development capabilities and resources, um, how knowledgeable or savvy are they with SEO or technical issues. I'd also say that there's huge value in exploring the website in some depth before you even begin the auditing process. Uh, something I'd like to see more of potentially is business owners, site owners and SEOs actually sitting together and, and crawling uh, or exploring a website to understand how it's structured, what makes it tick. Certainly when I'm doing an audit, that's one thing that I do is click around and get a picture of how the website works while my tools are collecting the data or, or crawling the site. So there's fewer surprises for you when you're actually looking into each issue. I'd also definitely say that you should get comfortable and try and share access to Google Analytics and Search Console data as much as you can before the audit starts. Uh, Search Console in particular, I think is increasingly invaluable for how it shows you how Google perceives and uh, crawls and, and indexes the pages on your website. My point being here that this is going to feed the brain of the audit that is going to be. It's going to provide a framework from the offset so that the audit is as relevant and useful as it can be. So my second tip is more for the auditors and the SEOs, which is that you really must validate the issues that are flagged up in order to effectively prioritize the recommendations you're going to make. So in this, I would say that you shouldn't follow too much of a template. Don't rely too heavily on checklists or even rely heavily on the tools you're using to provide accurate information. You know, not all high impact issues that are going to be flagged by SEMrush or Sitebulb or whatever tool are actually going to be the most important thing for the business that you're working with. It could be highlighting a subset of URLs, for example, which are just not super relevant to your search strategy or super important to fix. So I would say that, you know, even if you're 100 percent confident with the developers that you're handing your order over to, that's no excuse to delegate all of the investigation to them, especially if you're a junior SEO, uh, like I would have been a couple of years ago. Uh, a technical audit is a great opportunity to delve deeper into the website and figure out how technical issues arise, what makes the websites tick, and then you can rely less on tools and rely more on instinct. Uh, another reason that it's important to validate, of course, this will be obvious to most SEOs, is that different sites require different approaches. Uh, even sites within the same sector doing similar things can have vastly different priorities in, in terms of what you recommend. So, you know, if you're working in an e-commerce site, for example, that fasted navigation, page speed, these things potentially rise up the rankings in terms of importance. If you're looking at alt text, for example, uh, alternative definitions for your images, uh, that can be more or less important depending on the types of products that you're selling, whether image search is a key consideration in your traffic acquisition or whether accessibility in your sector is a major consideration for your users. Um, so something that I've been doing a lot, increasing with all my technical audits is prioritizing on a few different measurements, uh, the scale, for example, which URLs are affected, how important are those URLs, uh, by impact, as in the things that you think are going to make the most measurable immediate impact on the bottom line, the key objectives of the business that you're working with, and also by ease of implementation or difficulty, uh, whether this is a thing that two people with a CMS can solve in an afternoon, or whether it's an issue that requires a significant amount of planning and development resource to solve. So my point here is really that the more intimate your understanding, the more uh, your priorities are going to be in the right order for the client or the website at hand. 
Uh, my final point here is around uh, tailoring, which is really more to do with uh, the presentation of any documentation that you're going to give alongside this audit. So knowing the team, knowing the website, you're going to have a clear idea at this point who's going to be reading, who's going to be implementing, or even selling the recommendations of the audit within the organization. And this will give you a guide as to how you want to present it, how many different types of formats you want to present in. Um, you've got sheets, spreadsheets, of course, Word documents, slideshows. Uh, each of these can be more or less useful. You could want a combination of the three, depending on who you're working with. And it should be matched to that understanding that we've discussed. You know, um, what are the capabilities of the team that you're working with? I think as uh, SEOs, we sometimes get a reputation for being box tickers. I've definitely encountered this. And I think that's because with technical audits, sometimes you're tempted to just give a kitchen sink list of every single issue that you've discovered. And sometimes actually less is more. That might not be necessary. It could be that you want to present mainly the five or six sort of mission critical issues, things that are really going to be the most essential to the business immediately. And sometimes more detail is needed. Sometimes less detail is needed, depending on where you are in the, the process of this audit and getting it through the organization. Ultimately, uh, this is all about getting an audit in such a shape because ultimately it's about getting the buy-in, getting those actions completed. And I think if done correctly, if framed correctly, if we do some of these things that I've talked about, there's going to be a really explicit link in the audit materials between the findings, the recommendations that you're making, and the business implications of doing or not doing certain actions. So uh, in summary, uh, what I've talked about will be up on uh, the slide in terms of uh, intimacy and understanding uh, and so on. Uh, my point being not necessarily that I'm perfect at this. I don't think I've ever seen a perfect SEO or technical audit necessarily, but improving the way that we communicate and work together just as marketers uh, and in general, as, as businesses and SEOs working together, we can always do more to improve the way we do things. So thanks for listening to my talk. I'll hand over now to Imogen. Awesome. Um, so yeah, really just building on, on what Brendan was saying there in terms of really getting those foundations in place to begin with. Um, what I want to take a look at is a little bit more of the, the technical enhancement side of things. And to me, that really means sort of making your website as efficient as possible. Um, and really then just making really good use of like all of the internal links, making sure your canonicals are working and really sort of getting under the skin of those faceted navigations as well. Um, so the first thing to, to really cover off is that efficiency does lead to effectiveness. So the easier you can make it for Google and other crawlers to actually get around your website, the more effective it's going to be when it comes to actually driving that performance. So as sort of Brendan was saying, you really need to understand sort of the business understanding and what those sort of business objectives are and where that performance comes from, and then sort of work that into your technical audits as well. But one of the ways that I quite like to do that is really sort of just treating crawlers like they're toddlers. So you make it sort of as easy as possible for them to get where they need to with minimal distractions and like try and sort of rein in that level of destruction that they can cause in their path. Um, and a lot of that really does start with sort of understanding the structure of your site and really getting under the skin of those sort of crawl maps and directory graphs and then really checking sort of where the internal links are going and why that is the case. Um, which goes to the second point, if we sort of look at internal links, um, a lot of people seem to think internal links are just there for, for crawlers to actually get around a website. Um, more and more frequently, what we're seeing now is internal links are actually a really big driver of performance. So if you start treating them like connections and you start using them as sort of contextual forms um, between different pages and different sections of your website, then that actually adds a lot more value as well. So just knowing sort of that they're working isn't quite good enough. Um, you really need to understand sort of the anchor text behind it, make sure that the, the status is good and it, it's working as you need them to, um, but really understanding that contextual placement as well. 
and then that can sort of help give you more of an idea of, of where things are going and why they should be that way. Um, and then the third part is really looking at sort of these canonical setups. Now, I personally think that canonical tags are really underrated, um, but they can cause like huge issues on your website. And to me, they, they can ruin your life. Um, one of the, the websites that I've sort of detailed here, um, we worked on at sort of the end of last year as an e-com website and over sort of 65% of this site was not indexable. And 30% of that was because of these canonicalized pages and everything going through sort of different canonical chains. Canonicals were going to non-indexable pages. There were conflicting rules. Um, so that just caused a huge headache. And really, if, if you're not using canonical tags correctly, then that can have like a, a huge sort of, um, what's the word, sort of disadvantage to performance, I suppose. Um, but you can use them to your advantage as well. So canonical tags, really, really important, especially across e-com sites. And if you get them right, they can really help with the performance side as well. And then the final part to, to look at is really, again, sort of focused on an e-com site, but not just from an e-com perspective, um, is really looking at your faceted navigations. So these are obviously in place, they help the users, they help, help crawlers, you can get around them. Um, they are in good places a lot of the time, but the main issue with faceted navigations is they do tend to cause spider traps. Um, and what we've sort of seen in the past and certainly what we've helped other businesses sort of overcome is really resolving those spider traps. And we did that a lot through this sort of no follow rule and then sort of a by facet reintroduction. So you can sort of re-index different facets at different times um, and really make sure that they're optimized as well. But with the sort of faceted side of things, you, you do really need to know what should be indexed, what should be crawlable what could be followed, what shouldn't be followed, um, and then really sort of use that to your advantage as well. So that would be sort of for an e-com site and certainly for any website that's got a big resource bank, um, definitely something to look into as well. Super, yeah. thanks Imogen. Let's hand it over to Karai. He's gonna to get to, I think, delve more. It's, it's nice, we start with sort of processes and into implementation at high level and into a bit more detailed technical advice. So take it away, yes. Karai. Okay, uh, hello everyone. I have eight slides and more than 100 suggestions and tips in seven <laughs> or eight different categories for just five minutes. So I will need to be super, super quick. And uh, if you if I skip some of the things here, please read them, and also you can use these articles as a roadmap for yourself. And the first one is actually the resource load order. You can download the same things with a different order so that your page or web page can be loaded faster. And at the right section here, in an image, uh, you can see the difference here. It's a little bit blurred, but you can imagine uh, the results here. The main point here, you should always load your most important resources at the first uh, order and you can change your resources priorities with uh, different browser hints such as per lot or you can also use a critical css within your git uh, section of html document and also you can download your css files as async thanks to media attribute so to use these uh, things as a strategy, you should learn how to test your web pages. So imagine that you have a web page and you have downloaded it in, as a static HTML file. Just change the change one of the CSS files places and then open your uh, Chrome browser DevTools and check the response times here or check uh, whenever, whenever they, fi they file that file has been loaded. So Thanks to this, this kind of a test culture, you can learn what is the best resource load order for a web page. And we can continue. Okay. And about the image optimization, just yesterday, Adi Osmani has published a new book. I recommend you to buy it, actually. But even if you don't read a book from Adi Osmani, and you can find most of the things that you can do here. For instance, you should use figure and picture tags for speaking with the search engine crawlers. They are important. It's important to use some HTML tags. And also, please try to use placeholders for your images. And also, you should use source set for different uh, 
screen views or different devices. And please try to use decoding async attributes for your images because it will make your CPUs or your device's CPUs, uh, it, it will make it easier uh, to load any kind of image. So basically, you will save a couple of milliseconds for every image. And for an e-commerce site, it's actually pretty important. About the AWIF, AWIF is actually a new kind of uh, image extension and it's definitely better than this picture or JPEX or any other kind of image extensions. Please use AWIF, but the bad news is that as at the moment, uh, Safari doesn't support that. So that's why actually we need this uh, source SRG set or SR set. Because if you use AWIF, sorry, if you, if you use AWIF, Safari won't be able to load it. And if you use also JPEG or web picture, Safari can use the second resource. And also, you shouldn't use the laser attribute of the Chrome. This might be a bit awkward to you, but it's actually not a cross-browser compatibility solutions. So you should use a kind of simple intersection observer API for your laser load setup. And also, if you can, if you if you are able to use SYG instead of JPEG, please use SYG or inline images. You can continue. About the caching strategy, uh, this 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 section is actually uh, simple. Uh, last modified expires ETEC and cache control. These are the response and request headers for your cache system, and you should be sure that you are using these uh, response and request headers. For, for, uh, for your setup or for your HTTP cache strategy. And also as a kind of detail, if you use cache control, you don't need to use expires. If you think that why it is important, because uh, even your request, I'm sorry, even your response headers have a ki kind of size. If you use too much response headers, it will bloat the response, uh, responses and also it will tire your uh, server if you if you are manager for a big site. So even you should compress your response headers. And also uh, there is service worker here. Uh, I hope you know what service worker is. If you don't know what it is, please learn it. It's just 35 lines of code it's in JavaScript and you can actually cache everything on your site for repeating visitors. So if a visitor is returning the second time, you can give everything from uh, his or her browser storage. So the site will be able to work even offline. So it's important. It's one of the uh, steps of the progressive web applications. This is the most important thing from the tip third. We can go. About the request count and also request map. Uh, for the request count, actually, there are lots of things that can be done. Uh, but the most important one is actually unifying the JavaScript and CSS files. And these, this, this section uh, is, a, is a, this is actually a little bit traditional. But uh, also, there are some unorthodox methodologies to decrease the request count, such as using base 64 uh, version of the images or inlining images. And also, there are lots of sites that use 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 DNS prefetch instead of preconnect. Actually, you should use preconnect instead of DNS prefetch because preconnect as a browser field also does the TLS negotiation and TCP handshake uh, protocols as a critical uh, situation. And also, if you unite all of your CSS and JavaScript files, probably you will get really a big file. So in such a situation, you will need to create different CSS files for your category pages, for your product pages, for your home page, and for your blog page. If you create different CSS files for every different page uh, section or page type, and if you load the necessary CSS file for only that specific page type, actually you will decrease the request count and also request your size. About the request map. Imagine that there is a website or a web page, and to render this page, you will need to make requests to different 60 IP addresses. And it's not a good situation. And to fix this, please use two or three 
different domains for your resources. One is for Syria, one is your main server, and of course one is Google, or maybe a couple of, at least maybe one more for your marketing scripts or tracks. We can continue. Uh, okay, about the request size, uh, the most important thing here is actually the Broadly. Uh, I, I hope most of the people already know what Broadly is. It, it's a, it provides a better compression on the server side and it's better by 36% according to Gizip. So please use Broadly instead of Gizip and also try to use HTTP 2.1 instead of the HTTP first version. And also, uh, for decreasing the request size, of course, you should uh, use minify and compress uh, technologies for your HTML, JavaScript, and CSS files. And please use WOF2 instead of WOF or TTF uh, extensions for your font files. There are still lots of sites that use or try to use the TTF. It's like using Windows 99 or something like that. <laughs> and also, uh, please keep your DOM simple. <laughs> Even sometimes I see some sites, uh, only their header menu is more than 1,000 1, months. So it's, we are not creating Empire State building here, okay? This is just a simple web page. You can use like 500 or 400. It's the best practice, okay? You don't need to use lots of things in the DOM. And also to, to decrease the DOM size, you can use pseudo classes of the CSS, like before, after, link, etc. I am saying this because uh, pseudo classes of the CSS uh, language, they are, they are not counted in the DOM size. And also try to not use third party, third party secrets as much as you can. And please refactor your CSS and JavaScript files always on. There are lots of unused variables in every size JavaScript files. And also you can refactor your CSS files. It's easy and so hard. We can continue. <coughs> and also CLS, uh, cumulative layout shifting or cumulative layout shift is not about page speed, it's about visual stability and usability of the web page. And actually, it is also about uh, health. It's actually a health issue too. Some people might even have crisis in terms of psychology, and also some people have some problems within their eyes. And some, if something sparks uh, suddenly, it makes them uncomfortable. And uh, about the CLS, actually, there are only three basic things. Try to not inject dynamic content. And if you if you have to inject dynamic content, please give a absolute hate to do that section or that division of the HTML document. And please take care of the uh, invisible uh, flush of invisible font and flush of unstyled font. Uh, to do this, actually, you can use font variables. For instance, I forgot to tell that, but uh, in the before slide, you will also see the font variables. You, you don't have to use five or six different font files for a web page. It's not a book. It's not art. You can just use one font file with different versions thanks to font variable. It's, a, it's actually a new technology, too. And thanks to op optimizing the font files, you can also fix the uh, CLS issues. And also, please always use the absolute dimension units, like pixels, for instance. OK, we can continue. As the se seventh one is actually this advanced. Uh, you might not be able to use this one properly. But remember, I, I have talked about the resource load order. If you tell browser load everything at the first second, probably you will create bottleneck for the CPU and you will destroy your first input delay score and also you will create a disastrously bad uh, total blocking time. So try to load things one by one and give space to the CPU so that it can load everything and also it can, it can stay as responsive, responsive. Because if you create a long task, Lots of long tasks. It will it it will mean that people won't be able to convert. They won't be able to input, and also you can test uh, all of these things thanks to Chrome Dev Tools or Developer Tools or of Firefox or Firefox Nightly, and also I recommend using the Firefox Nightly instead of Google Chrome or Google Chrome Canary for these type of tasks. There are lots of more 
different types of details in the Firefox Nightly. And the second image here is from Firefox. And also, uh, another last thing here is that uh, do not do not block the browser so that it can finish it can finish the DOM content loaded event. If you block the browser, probably you will destroy the first input play or other type of things, and you will create lots of wrong tasks. Okay, we can continue. Here's the last slide. Okay, lastly, as I said before. Uh, Pace speed is actually about health. It's not just about money, uh, because a slow page can make people angry. And according to the Google, a slow page can make people angry, angrier than an actual fight. Imagine that you are angrier to a web page more than Donald Trump. Actually, a web page can do that, and there are lots of web pages that can do that, especially in Turkey. So uh, there are some basic uh, terms here. I recommend you to make a research for them. For instance, Rail. Rail is a model of Google, response, animation, idle, and load. And Ali Osman says that we have only 10 milliseconds to move every pixel on a web page in terms of performance. So it's, an important, uh, it's important to understand Rail. And also check what these user-centric metrics are, like uh, per seat load speed. So it's, it's about speed index. I didn't include it uh, here. Uh, also, visual speed stability. We have talked about it. And load responsiveness or smoothness. And there are lots of other things about pace speed. I believe that pace speed optimization is actually a science. And you can test it. And you can, you can prove that you can optimize a website thanks to these type of tools. And that's it. Thank you for everything. That's brilliant. Thank you, Karai. So much, uh, so much detail there. And um, obviously, very short. Uh, you've done well to cover the amount of content and the time we had available. So thank you for that. Thank you. I think we could do an ultimate guide like we tend to do from these talks uh, uh, on uh, technical um, page optimization alone. But um, Carrie, have we got some questions from the audience out there? Yeah, I've got a few questions. Um, yeah. The first question we have is for Brendan. How long do you normally spend on a technical audit? Sometimes clients or prospects do not want to spend a lot of time on it. And that's definitely true. Um, you know, uh, I think it depends obviously a lot on the scale of the website, uh, what kind of site you're looking at. With SEO, I'm greedy. You know, I want as many hours as I can, as I can possibly get to really delve into the issues. Uh, I would like at least a day for most sites, potentially two, if it's getting quite complicated. I think that's the simplest answer I could give. Okay, Perfect. Great. Imogen, Corey, do you, what about you? Just quickly on that one. I, uh, I would definitely agree. I'd say a day minimum if we can get it. Um, just because it, it gives you all of the opportunity to look really sort of like under the hood of everything as well. Um, and then like Brendan was saying, it, it reduces the reliance on tools a lot. So the more time you can use, the better. Okay. Yeah, and I don't want to sound like John Miller, but it depends. And uh, it might be 10 hours, and also it might be 2 hours. According to the site, it changes. Of course. Okay. Carrie, that's great. Um, yeah. Uh, the next one we have, um, Imogen, can you go with this one first? Um, if you're already ranking for a keyword, but you want to shift the rankings to another URL, URL what is the best way to accomplish this other than adding more internal links to the new target page? Uh, so a lot of it is the internal links to the target page. Um, but one of the things that I'd say as well is really just updating the actual content on the page itself um, and making sure that that's all actually updated to the, the target keywords. Um, one of the other things you can do if you are sort of like really, really desperate for it is put it in the navigation for a short time. Um, and that just helps improve the speed that it's crawled as well. So that would be sort of a last resort, I would say, but if you're desperate for it to change, then that's a good place to start. Okay, Great. perfect. Thank you. Anything else from the audience there? Yeah, we just got another one. Um, uh, Corey, if you want to answer this one. What does it mean if Google adds a geo tag to, uh, to your title tag when geo is not present in the title tag. Anything else you would recommend in this type of instance? Yeah, I couldn't understand the question clearly, actually. Uh, I guess uh, the question means that adding a kind of addition to title tag according to geographic differences or something like that? 
I believe so, yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, if you change your title tag, uh, <clears throat> according to a kind of geo tagging or any kind of geo targeting situation, probably after a point, Google will start to ignore it because uh, you shouldn't change it from the same URL. If you have a, a diversified, diversified audience, you should actually use a kind of different pages and you should use an international uh, tagging like reflex and you should use different tags for different audiences or geographies. But also if you mean to perform a kind of A-B test with the, your title tags, uh, then you can do that, but please keep it, uh, keep it shorter than two weeks. Perfect. Um, well, I think I answered the question well. I wasn't quite sure of the interpretation of the question, but you managed to uh, to to interpret it and answer it. So well, well done. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just going to just come in with a couple of quick questions. Uh, I think there's one. Oh, we have on. one last one. One more. Audience. Oh, go on. Go for it. Okay, um, Brendan, can you just answer this one quickly? In what format do you present the data back to the client if you're dealing with non-technical people who have to understand in order to get fixes in the action list and maybe budgets? So I suppose again, it's a, it sort of depends answer. Like I was saying, there's there's quite a lot of shades of difference between how technically savvy some can be. Sometimes it's little, and sometimes it's absolutely nothing. Um, I tend to think the less savvy, the more simple communication needs to be. That's when I start to rely more on slideshows. Uh, you know, individual slides breaking down issues, telling a story, as it were, for why you need to fix things and how it's working. Um, I tend to, at the moment, have a kind of standard mix of spreadsheets and documentation, uh, like a Word document that breaks things down in more detail, with the spreadsheet having your kind of priority list and smaller explanations of the reasoning and how you go about fixing things. So I think often uh, a combination of presentation styles is, is necessary. Great, thank you. Perfect. That's um, all the questions we have for the audience. So. Okay, so, so I just want to sort of wrap up and, and just a couple of final thoughts from you guys, really. Um, there's such a, a, a huge area to cover in such a short period of time, but I know the one thing that's all on all of our minds is uh, this Core Web Vitals thing, apparently, some sort of Core Web Vitals update Google might have let us know about, and uh, it may well be coming in May, but now apparently it's coming in June. How big an impact is this update going to have um, on our sites? How scared should we be? Who wants to come in on that? Imogen, what's your view? Um, I think, to be honest, a lot of it has been a little bit blown out of proportion more recently. Um, obviously, sort of when it first came out, everyone was panicking and everyone was like, oh my God, Google are telling us about an update. It's going to be huge. It's going to be massive. But realistically, a lot of SEO hasn't changed. Like It's always been about the experience. It's always been about making sure your website is actually doing these things. Um, so I think if you're doing that stuff anyway and you are making sure you're you're doing a good mobile experience and it is reacting very quickly, um, you won't see a huge impact from it. But if you're not doing that already, then you will see the impact. So it's more just kind of building on everything that we've been doing already and making sure that we've, we've got everything sort of in Google's good books. All right, perfect. So, so Pounds clients are in good hands. What about yours, Brendan? Um, yeah, I tend to agree with that. I'm increasingly kind of zen about it. I don't expect that on the rollout you're going to see a huge wave of impact, hopefully, um, in the way that PageSpeed has been treated previously by Google. I think you're more likely to be on the losing end if you're already doing the very least you can do in terms of user experience. They mark things as a pass or a fail, I think, likely to see a slower kind of impact as they start to tweak the knobs on that and make it more important but hopefully it is a prompt to do some of the things that um, were mentioned in the, in the talk on, on page speed it could potentially lead to the development of a healthier web and a healthier way of building websites all the things we should have been doing for years anyway folks exactly. and the user experience and okay and and Corey, any uh you know what's the situation over there is everyone Panicking, running around like headless chickens, worrying about this, or is it yeah, uh, everyone actually, cool? Yeah, actually, people are uh, people here. Uh, they are panicking for fixing all of the situations uh, or anything related to the core web vitals. But also, I believe that uh, after the update, we will see that it won't affect that much 
because uh, as Martin Schiffit and also John Miller and also Garrett from Google Search Liaison, I have a problem with that word actually. I can't say that many times. Anyway, uh, Gary said that PageSpeed is actually not a main ranking factor. They have said this repeatedly. Uh, for some queries, yeah, it will affect, I believe, that because there are lots of competition for uh, these keywords, but most of the web won't be affected in terms of SEO. Uh, core Web Vitals, I think it's mainly for the users. Uh, and uh, as Brandon said, it's a healthy, for the healthier web. And also, uh, there is a minor detail. Uh, maybe we can also mention that Core Web Vitals also makes web faster, and also a faster web means a cheaper web. So it's also better for Google's own internal economy too. It's about the kind of side uh, situation of all of these pictures. Surely Google aren't doing things for their own benefit. They just love users, and they're just <laughs> doing it for, for the love of users. Um, so. Uh, Okay, so everyone's everyone's fairly relaxed. And personally, I'm I'm a bit worried about small businesses. You know, my background of years ago of working mm -hmm. in the small business environment is um, it's all right for for the slightly bigger businesses that can afford these great uh, agencies and experts like yourselves. Uh, but if you're a small business and you're running on some sort of CMS online, I don't know Squarespace, Wix, Shopify, God knows what else, WordPress, Joomla, you know. Uh, and you've got a, a, a site that's you know, home growing or DIY or a part-time friend has done it for you, are you going to run into issues? Or are, just generally, is it a case of, well, um, you know, you'll be running into these issues anyway, and actually you should try and focus on building the best website. So, um, so if, if you know, for me, that's the only thing I, think I, I worry the small business because um, I think the big companies can throw money at it and solve this problem. But hopefully with uh, people like yourselves uh, giving out great advice for free, taking the time to share their knowledge, um, certainly some of, uh, some of the people out there can, uh, can actually rectify the situation and build better websites for users that also rank better in the search engines. Um, I've got lots of questions, but I think we're running out of time. So um, I will draw it a line under it there, much as I would love to um, ask uh, Imogen about how she treats bots like toddlers. Um, but um, I've got lots of quotes from yours today, you know, canonicals can ruin your life, uh, treat spots like to toddlers, chains are great accessories, but don't live on your site. So, so thanks for that. Um, and, um, you know, I'm sure we could talk about spider traps uh, and, and all sorts of things until the cows come home. But hopefully, I mean, you guys were kind enough to, to uh, you know, pop some of this down and we'll get out a blog post and uh, we normally put together an ultimate guide um, and we can probably build on the technical SEO sessions that we've done before with other great SEO experts so we can really put together a great resource that lives and breathes and is dynamic as Google changes things and keeps us on our toes. So with that, I'd love to say thanks very much to everybody. Thanks for our audience. Um, good to see some old faces on there again, like Simon with his questions just uh, uh, suggesting about uh, Corey's point about setting up and um, segmenting CSS. Um, so I think he's agreeing with you there. Simon, it's about time we had you on presenting. Um, thank you all, uh, wherever you are in the world, and we'll see you again in a month's time for the next Tea Time SEO. Until then, stay safe. Thank you. Stay thank safe. You.